Welcome back. Well, you know, everybody's having the same problem right now, trying to find ammo, and then if you find ammo, you can't find a place to shoot it. But I can shoot in my backyard today uh, with the neighbors not too very far away, and I don't have to worry about it because I got a beautiful new Beeman R7, and uh, this is a uh, gun made in Germany by Freirauch. Pardon my German pronunciation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, air guns as we know them in this country uh, before I talk about this rifle. You know, as I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, most people knew air guns basically by the, the Daisy line, the Daisy, uh, you know, Red Riders and uh, Model 500 and Model 25 pump action. Uh, they were smooth bore BB guns, basically, you know, fairly low powered, you know, 250 to 325 feet per second or so, depending on the model. And um, they were quite simple. Uh, they were, they were, they had an internal spring piston, and uh, when you cocked it, it, it compressed air at the instant of firing and uh, spit out a BB. And they were repeaters, you know, you could, uh, every time you, every time you cocked it, you had another shot. So. As you got older, you could uh, get into a uh, pneumatic pellet rifle. You know, pellet rifles made by Benjamin, or Crossman, some people who had a couple bucks more, you know, could spend 20, 25, 28 dollars more. Uh, I should say 28 dollars. Uh, they could buy a, a Sheridan, you know, Blue Streak or a Silver Streak. And those were a little bit upper crust. They were five millimeter, uh, 20 caliber, 20 caliber pellet rifles. and uh, they were pumped up pneumatics for every, you know, you pumped them anywhere from uh, three to eight pumps and uh, you got, you got a, a velocity of maybe up to 625 feet per second with some of the more powerful Sheridans and things. But uh, they were, you know, they, were, they had limitations. Uh, first of all, they were rather uh, cumbersome. To, it took time to pump them up. And uh, depending on the speed that you pumped it, uh, you know, the physics involved with with uh, compressing air, if you compress it, uh, if you compress air, it, the heat, the, the heat that's generated by the molecules compressing, uh, creates a different density than when it cools off a few seconds later, or maybe a minute or two later. So, uh, accuracy was uh, okay; wasn't bad. Uh, within you know, within 25 yards or so, you could you could uh, certainly hit a pigeon or something like that. Um, but I would say that that was, that was typical of the American market back then, whether it was a Sheridan or a Crossman or a, or, or a uh, Benjamin, that was about it. Uh, then along came some uh, CO2 guns. I had a, a Daisy CO2 200 pistol, and um, I would say that that really got my interest going in, in handgun shooting. Uh, my dad got that for me uh, on a, a fishing trip way up in... Uh, Moosehead Lake, Maine, up in um, up in the middle of Maine, back in the uh, mid '60s, early '60s, and um, with that Daisy BB CO2 BB gun, uh, that that was a hard-hitting repeater, um, but it was also quite accurate within uh, you know within 15 meters or so, 15 yards, and uh, I learned to do uh, quite a lot of shooting with that. The uh, the interest in the interest in uh, guns didn't uh, wane as I went along, and uh, you know I, I got older and got involved with centerfire guns and rim fires and things. Uh, but then about the mid 70s, a uh, Dr. Robert Beeman uh, began importing uh, very fine European uh, air guns, and uh, they were spring air guns, and uh, he also uh, imported uh, a certain number of uh, CO2 guns, uh, not too many of them, mostly spring air guns when he first started out being produced by Walther. And uh, Walther had been importing a few uh, guns back in the 60s to this country. And before World War II, uh, they, they had certainly imported uh, some spring air guns. Matter of fact, there was, a, you know, I watched some time ago I watched an old movie on uh, Turner Classic Movies uh, with uh, William Powell 
and uh, Myrna Loy. It was, uh, I think it was The Return of the Thin Man, one of the Thin, thin Man movies back around mid, mid-30s. And there was a uh, funny Christmas scene where he was uh, on the couch and he was shooting a, uh, he was basically shooting off a, a pistol grip form of a, uh, it looked like a Walther uh, spring air gun. He cocked the barrel in the middle and he was shooting uh, Christmas ornaments to his uh, wife's uh, delight. So, and then he finally shot the window out. But, um, so that shows you that spring air guns have been around and uh, were certainly known uh, by, the, by uh, the, you know, German manufacturers and things like that. Well, certainly the Second World War kind of uh, killed that enterprise. We didn't have any imports to this country uh, for quite a long time until Dr. Beeman started bringing them in in the mid-70s. So some 45 years ago, uh, I, I picked up a catalog that was uh, left on the counter of a sporting goods shop by my very best friend. Um, it was his store. And he was getting involved with uh, Beeman guns. Uh, a Feinberg bow, he got a Feinberg bow uh, model 124. And uh, shortly after that, he got a, uh, uh, he got a Viral uh, HW77, I think it was. That was an under lever. Uh, it was an underlever caulking gun, very, very, very accurate, very, very nice gun. And that Feinberg Bow 124 was extremely accurate, also a little bit less power, but uh, superbly accurate. Uh, it was a, it was a lightweight field gun that probably shot about 600, 625 feet per second, depending on uh, the the pellet used. And uh, these were all 177 uh, pellet rifles. Uh, but Dr. Beeman uh, began to uh, have his own uh, guns produced under the, you know, under his name, uh, starting with the Beeman R1. That's a re relatively famous uh, rifle now, uh, very well known. It um, it, start, it it was made by Weirauch, and it was a uh, it was probably the first of the uh, serious uh, Magnum spring air guns. Uh, there was the Diana RWS, uh, I think it was a Model 45 or something that was, that was in about the same time, but uh, it, was, I, it was certainly not as well made. More, it had plastic parts and things where the, where the R1 was made really with uh, the, the best possible materials. A lot of blued steel where you know, other companies would use plastic. Uh, it, was a extreme, it had the, the record trigger. Um, and as time went on, uh, Dr. Beeman imported more and more guns, and I think his, his writings in the catalogs that are now collector's items, if you can find one of those original catalogs, I think the first two or three were in black and white, and uh, then he began producing them in, uh, in, in full, full color. They were, really, they were really amazing. I mean, they, they not only just had pictorials of the, of the guns that he was selling, but he also had uh, very, very good descriptions of the different types of pneumatic, uh, pneumatic guns and the, each one of them's advantages and their shortcoming, shortcomings as well. Um, but I, I had quite a number of uh, air guns through the years, uh, including I think my last guns were, uh, I had a Feinberg Bow Model 300S, which was a superbly accurate Olympic grade gun. It was a side, it was a side lever caulking gun. Uh, 177, and I think that that delivered a pellet at around 550 or so feet per second, but always through the same hole. I mean, it was it literally, it, it just came out the barrel and went down the same hole all the time. It was extremely accurate, uh, virtually, virtually silent. I could shoot that in the, I could shoot that down the hallway of our house, and I had to put up warning signs because nobody would even know I'm shooting uh, so to make sure that they didn't walk into the path of fire. Um, that was a whisper. Uh, then I had a, and it had no recoil whatsoever, so that was the thing that really assisted uh, in, in getting his accuracy. Um, you know, and now we have, now we have evolved into a, a very specialized type of gun, which is the PCP, the pre-charged pneumatic. Um, and the pre-charged pneumatics are, that brings it to another level. These are, these are guns that are using, you know, highly compressed air. Uh, which is usually fed by uh, a charge with a like a scuba tank or something of that sort or a, or a compression pump. That's those guns are those guns are up there in price, um, and now they're getting into very very large calibers too. You know, suitable even for 
um, for a large game. So anyway, I want to just talk about this particular gun here. And you might wonder why I got a Beeman R7. This is sometimes categorized as a youth model gun or for, for women. Well, I got it because uh, it's, it's probably, it, I would say that this is arguably, uh, if not the most accurate Springer made, it's certainly uh, one of them. Um, this is an extremely accurate gun, but owing to that low recoil factor, um, it's, a, uh, it's classified as a 700 foot per second uh, spring air gun, which is a, a good 200 to 300 feet per second slower than the so-called Magnums. Um, and I've had the Magnums, uh, you know, I had a, I had a, a, a cr the most powerful one I had was a, a, a Crow Magnum made by uh, Theobend in England. And that was uh, that was not a spring air gun. It was a uh, it had a compressed piston, uh, and it was a piston uh, piston driven uh, type of gun. The type of you know the type of piston that you find in the struts inside your car. You know the hold your hood up and things like that. That's that sort of that sort of compressed piston. That's what drove the pellet out. Uh, extremely hard caulking. I think the caulking effort on that thing was well up over 65 pounds of caulking effort. It was a it was a bear to caulk. Uh, it was a it was a I had a 20 caliber model, um, you know, and I shot woodchucks with that and drove drove 20 caliber pellets right straight through them, you know, from 30 40 yards away. And that pellet never even stopped. That was a powerful powerful gun. But accuracy, eh? You know, you were you were lucky if you could get you were lucky if you could get an inch and three quarters at, at 25 yards, which I didn't consider to be all that accurate. What? And sometimes if you held it wrong, uh, you know, you'd be lucky if you could hit a pie plate at 25 yards because these things require a different touch than a uh, uh, a regular gun. You have to uh, you you have to basically use what's called the artillery hold. It's become known as. Uh, they didn't have such names when I was beginning to use them in the 70s and it was you just kind of learned that you had to hold them lightly so that to allow for the gun to just uh, rebound on its own because as that spring slams forward the gun comes back with a jolt and uh, which causes issues with certain scopes uh, I think a little bit is much uh, made of so-called uh, spring air uh, classified scopes. Any of your good scope manufacturers, center rifle scope manufacturers like, you know, Bushnell or L certainly Leupold, any of the high grade expensive uh, rifle scopes will certainly handle the recoil of a springer. I put them on it, I know they do. Uh, the problem is, is that they don't have an adjustable objective that goes down, they don't have a parallax setting that goes down to uh, the range that's necessary for a pellet rifle, which is, you know, you're talking inside sometime, most of the time inside 25 yards and almost always, you know, inside 50 or 60 yards, even with the larger ones, even with the more powerful ones. So um, that's, that's their limitation. So anyway, there are, uh, there are a, a lot of uh, nice uh, pellet gun scopes made. I happen to have a Hawk on this one, H-A-W-K-E. Uh, it's a it's a British company originated in Britain, but it's made in uh, made in China, um, and it's a it's a really it's a really handsome scope. Uh, this is a three to nine, and you, you know I I don't favor high powered scopes on my uh, 22 or my my uh, high power uh, rifles, but you know with a, with a pellet rifle, you know we want to shoot if, if you want to shoot aspirins at uh, 25 yards or something. With a gun like this, uh, this this gun makes that po this this scope makes that possible. So, um, really accurate has uh, has nice nice adjustments. Uh, very very firm, uh, smooth. There's no no feel of grinding parts at all. Uh, you know, multi coated lenses. I can see the I can see the coating. Uh, and you know it does it's it's effective uh, and for for a scope that's surprisingly uh, down in the in the range of about a hundred or a hundred or so dollars I think this scope goes normally for about a hundred and hundred and nine or something like that it's amazing uh, what I could get out of this for for quality and uh, it's got uh, it's 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 the the adjustment ring for power is very very smooth silky smooth really nice. Um, and uh, it's got uh, adjustable eyepiece, adjustable 
uh, diopter here, and that also runs smooth. And it, do, and it doesn't it doesn't turn accidentally if I brush it against my clothes. I have to I have to make a physical effort to turn that, which is also a nice thing. Some of the cheaper ones out there will, uh, you know, they're, they're always slopping around, and uh, you can tell that you can tell that they're inexpensively made. But this is a good scope. It uh, goes along well. It, it, it enhances the accuracy of this uh, rifle. This, this Beam and R7, it's, uh, it's essentially the, you know, it came out as the Beam and R7 first, and then uh, Viroc, uh got rights to make it under the uh, name of the HW30, I think it's the HW30S. Uh, a little bit different. It has, I, I would say that the, the fore end is chopped off about where this, screw is here so it's not as it's not as pretty up front it doesn't cover up this uh this this knuckle here it 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 this is this is a little bit prettier uh the checkering on this is nice it's got an ambidextrous stock for both uh righties and lefties uh, it's a beechwood stock and this comes in different models you can i think i've seen this in stainless or nickel or whatever and i've also seen this um with uh, synthetic stocks, but this is a really nice, uh, nice handling gun. Um, I took the um, I took the globe front sight off it. It had a target style uh, front sight. You can see the uh, dovetails here uh, that it sat on, screwed onto, and uh, had a nice had a nice blade leaf rear sight that uh, had different. It had four different apertures for that. Four different blade settings for that, and it also had, uh, I think, five or six different uh, uh, apertures, uh, front posts and circles, and all sorts of stuff for the front end, uh, bead front end. So um, it came very well set up. This gun is very smooth shooting. Um, it's very very accurate. What's what's really nice with this gun is that it cocks quite easily. Very very easy cocking. Now you never you never ever uh, fire a spring air gun without a pellet in it because lacking that resistance that that's that spring will slam forward without anything cushioning that uh, seal up front and eventually you'll you'll ruin the gun so you never allow that gun to uh, fire if you know it, it happens on it, it happens on occasion by accident but if it happens you shouldn't you shouldn't be uh, overly concerned if it happens a couple of times accidentally but it's something that you have to work to prevent once you get used to these you realize that um, you know there's a, there's a process involved with cocking it and installing a pellet and uh, shooting and everything and I'm going to go through that I'm going to set up my I'm going to set up my shooting bench here and I've got a target set at 25 yards I'll probably fire a few shots at uh, at 15 yards as well and uh, just show you what this gun is capable of it's nice and calm right now so let's get at it before the uh, sun goes away well you're probably wondering what I'm doing with this get up you know where's my Where's my uh, fancy rest? Well, this is actually the best that it gets for uh, this is this is this is the way to go for a uh, spring air rifle. Uh, it's got to be resilient. I mean, really resilient, and it should slide, offer absolutely no resistance to the uh, gun whatsoever, because there's a vibration there. Um, there's recoil there. Now you say, well, there's recoil in uh, in all rifles. Well, that's true. But the problem is with the barrel time. Uh, this pellet has not left the barrel, hasn't even begun to go down the barrel uh, when the recoil is in the middle of its operation. And uh, so during, during, the cycling, uh, during the cycle of that pellet traveling down the barrel, uh, the recoil is taking effect and moving it all over the place. So you want to have a consistency uh, so that it doesn't bounce around. You don't want to bounce off your shoulder. You don't want to bounce off this bag or the front front rest or whatever. You want the gun to just be able to relax, I should say, uh, just recoil on its own. Um, and that's why that's why the so-called artillery hold is favored. In other words, the, the gun just simply comes back and you push it back to battery, it comes back, you push it back to battery, and that sort, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's very effective and it, uh, it kills the tendency for the uh, vibration to uh, 
I should say it controls the tendency for the rifle to uh, want to throw pellets from one place to another because the difference in accuracy can be stunning. I sometimes read uh, people reviewing certain air guns and saying, gee, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see this accuracy that everybody else is seeing. Everybody else is claiming, uh, you know, three quarters of an inch at, a, at 25 yards and I'm, not, I'm getting two and a half or three inches. Well, they probably are. There's, there's hardly any question. Uh, but somebody else might be able to get uh, three quarters of an inch or even better uh, simply because they know what to do, uh, simply because they know uh, that the operation of a, a, a spring air pellet rifle, a springer, is very, very different than anything else. So um, that's its drawback. Um, but once, you, once you've managed to uh, control that recoil uh, problem, uh, you you can uh, you can find these things to be extremely accurate. I'm going to be shooting some uh, field target trophies by H and N. It's an imported uh, pellet from Germany, and uh, these pellets are uh, they're uh, 8.64 grains. Uh, the weight of a pellet in a in a spring air gun, and for the most part, any type of uh, air air gun. Uh, the weight of the pellet can have an awful lot to do with its uh, accuracy. This gun tends to favor uh, pellets around around eight and a half grains. Uh, there's a few pellets that will shoot fairly good uh, up to ten grains. Um, but uh, you know, if if you have too heavy a pellet, uh, the velocity slows down markedly. You know, uh, this is classified as a 700 foot per second gun. That would be with uh, alloy pellets. You know, that are non-lead type pellets like the uh, H&N Barracuda that's a it's a it's a, a green bullet a green pellet and that one that one will slightly top uh, 700 feet per second in this gun most of them are going to be closer to uh, 650 630 that sort of thing but uh, they have telling effect I mean this this will drive a this will drive a pellet right clear through a um, right clear through uh, the the front side of a uh, tin can, not a, not an aluminum can, but a real steel can, uh, up to uh, 50 yards or more. Uh, I've done it many times, and, and it, it pokes a pretty good sized hole. It expands nicely with that uh, pure lead pellet. Um, but as I was saying, you know, Dr. Beeman was the one who probably, I, I would say that he could be credited with uh, bringing uh, air guns to the American market in the uh, mid-70s. It was a slow takeoff, very slow. I'm not sure whether he ever realized too much of the uh, fruits that are now um, available. Where you know we've got we've got countless manufacturers importing uh, guns, and now they're be being made by Sig Arms, Ruger, you name it. I mean, familiar names to the American public. But uh, back in the '70s and '80s, I mean, these were really curiosities. I remember bringing I remember bringing my different uh, air guns to the to the station the police station uh, you know after hours to just just shoot them inside down at the range and to you know, maybe sight in a new scope or something like that and people would look at it, and it like it was a like it was a, something they'd never seen from outer space before they what's that what the heck is that you know and when they fired it they they just never experienced anything like that they they were only familiar with the the pumped up you know uh, crossmans and benjamins and things so this was really a curiosity, and I wouldn't say that that uh, I wouldn't say that that little factoid changed until well into the 90s. Uh, it was probably it was probably only uh, less than 20 years ago that these started to really take off, and uh, you know some of the import catalog companies, you know, like um, uh, Cabela's and and things, uh, they were the ones that I think started promoting some of these guns. Uh, at at reason, fairly reasonable prices, the RWS uh, guns and uh, Gamo, uh, some of these brands that uh, are quite familiar to us now, you know, were fairly new not not too long ago, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm going to I'm going to show you how one of these things operates, and uh, how you can have an awful lot of fun. This is this is actually this is actually one of the quietest uh, spring air guns made, one of the quietest pneumatic guns of all, uh, regardless of type. Um, it uh, has a very, very, uh, it has a very, very subdued report, um, and uh, it has a very subdued recoil. Uh, it still has to be, you still have to manage it, uh, but it's, it's less susceptible to error. Now, one of the things that uh, most, 
most uh, break barrel style guns. Now, the, you know, spring air gun can be it can be a side lever cocking like the uh, Diana, the RWS Diana, uh, like my old Feinberg Bow 300S uh, had that. There was a different class of a gun. Uh, and there's under lever cocking is like the HW77 and the 97, the cock from underneath. Uh, and those are rigid barrels. And the, the ideal with that is that the rigid barrel doesn't, there's no, there's no potential for it to uh, get out of uh, position every time you cock it. So there's a, there's a regimen involved. Um, and there's also, you know, there can be what's called barrel droop. Uh, where you know where a gun as it ages, uh, it doesn't lock up the same anymore, and also possibly from uh, overexerting the barrel, uh, and and you, you can actually bend these if you if you're a you know muscle man. So you don't want to you don't want to abuse them. I'll show you how you actually uh, cock it and uh, shoot it. So the idea is to whether you're standing or sitting, position the butt against your hip, and give it a at the end of the barrel where, where you get some leverage give it a wrap and that breaks the that breaks the action there's a there's a ball bearing detent there uh, it's a big ball bearing about three-eighths of an inch in diameter and that starts that breaks the action then you want to just smoothly pull it down until it cocks now this one's got a very light cocking action um, I think it's supposed to be somewhere around 18 pounds of uh, cocking effort which is extremely light uh, I mean, a, you know, a, a youth, you know, a, a 10 or 12 year old could cock this, I would say, without much difficulty, and an adult can cock it all day long. Um, many people, many pr people who are in the business who, you know, get to shoot these every day and shoot everything that they want to shoot, um, they, many of them will, if you can read up on it, many of them will prefer the Beeman R7 over any of them just to have fun because it's not always about, you know, having power. The power is great when you're shooting at, you know, woodchucks and when you want to take longer shots at things like, you know, larger game like rabbits and things like that, then the power is really great. But, you know, the, the, the nice thing about a, an air gun is being able to just shoot it in your backyard without disturbing the neighbors and without making them alarmed, you know, with with the bark that some of these magnums can put out. When I had it, when I had my Diana, that RWS Diana, that thing, that thing did, that thing did sound off, and it was, it was something that kind of, it made me shy to be shooting it too much in the backyard because you no know, neighbors would be getting upset and things. So I, I you know, I want to live, I want to live a long time with my neighbors without getting them uh, torqued off. So anyway. You'll see this, and what you do is you, you hold that barrel, always hold the barrel, even though there's a bear trap mechanism, anti-bear trap mechanism that prevents it theoretically from flying forward and closing. If that's your close on your finger, it can bite off the end of your finger. It'd be a very painful thing, uh, and it's almost surely going to break the gun. It's going to surely break the stock. You don't ever want to have that thing fly up on its own. That's an absolute cardinal no-no. So you insert the pellet uh, dome first or point first and press it in with your, the, the smooth part of your finger, nice and, nice and smooth. Uh, press it in until that skirt is uh, flush with the end of the gun. And then just rotate the barrel with a firm, uh, deliberate stroke, but don't, don't overexert it. Now, many of the spring air guns have got a um, automatic cocked safety so every time you every time you cock it the uh, safety uh, returns back to uh, its uh, standard uh, safe position so you click it off now this record trigger is extremely light this is a uh, I've got to set it about a pound pound and a quarter uh, it's a two stage trigger uh, you can set it up to you know four or five pounds or more if you want it's considered to be one of the it's considered to be one of the best uh, spring air triggers triggers ever made it's it's probably one of the best triggers period uh it's extremely light uh, very manageable and uh i've got a target down there at 25 yards and uh, my light is failing but this scope is nice and bright it's got it's got mill dot it's got a mill dot reticle so i can i can position this at uh, 25 yards with the crosshair right dead in the middle i can go up to 35 yards with you know one and a half dots down uh, go 50 yards I'm three dots down so uh, it's and it's right on the button so let's get shooting it now just watch this uh, watch this you notice I'm not exerting pressure here I, I want this gun to be able to just bounce back and forth 
it's unlike a centerfire rifle. I don't want to. I don't want to try to uh, ride with the recoil. I want it to ride back into my shoulder, just as easy as can be. Nice smooth trigger pull. Do that again. You notice how quiet that was. Um, always cock it with a firm stroke down and just a firm stroke back. Don't don't uh, slap it down and back. That safety you have to remember every single time you shoot. This gun is just as smooth as it gets. It's just so, so nicely made, precision, precision made. And you know these these pellets come 500 to the tin, sometimes sometimes less, but 500 to the tin is typical, and. Uh, you're talking, you know, anywhere from nine to nine to fifteen dollars a tin. Uh, it's a lot of shooting for the money, and uh, some of these pellets are extremely good for uh, small game. Um, and these guns also have certain peculiarities. I've I've spoken about um, lubrication. Uh, with with guns before, uh, I, I'm not a I'm not a lubricator. Uh, guns don't really need lubrication per se. They need to just be wiped down with a lightly oiled cloth. Uh, these guns here, in particular, uh, you never apply oil to the uh, air chamber because applying oil to the air chamber will cause dieseling, uh, just like a just like a diesel engine when it's when the piston is compressing in the cylinder, uh, it creates heat from that compression, which which Ex, you know, explodes, uh, which fires up, and that's what happens with this. If if uh, you have oil in this uh, com combustion chamber, uh, even the slight, just one drop of oil is all it needs. You'll have dieseling. It'll drive that pellet down range at supersonic speeds, but uh, it'll also cause a lot of damage to the inside of this uh, gun uh, without much difficulty. So you want to avoid you want to avoid oiling it. Um, and uh, there is a there are there are certain lubricants that are used as a there's a gel there's a lubricating gel for the uh, uh, the knuckle mechanism that where the the uh, the hinge mechanism uh, which is used I mean you you go through several thousand shots before you need to redo that lubrication and uh, naturally like all guns you can wipe them down with a, a lightly oiled cloth uh, but that's about it. Uh, they take very little maintenance. It's a, they're a great pastime. A gun like this goes about 300 bucks uh, without a scope, and then add another 100, 150, 200, whatever you want to pay for a scope. Uh, but this one here is about 110 dollars without the mounts. The mounts are another 20, 25 dollars or so. So all told, uh, you know, it's an investment, uh, but it's it's probably on the same order as a, a decent uh, 22. Um, but you can shoot it all the time. I mean, I can shoot it out here in my backyard and the neighbors aren't gonna be concerned. They're not gonna go crazy. They're not even gonna hear this thing. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I can keep up my shooting. Uh, you know, I can, I can set up my little steel silhouettes out there. I have uh, uh, to scale, um, you know, steel silhouettes with the chicken and pigs and, and uh, turkey and, and ram. They're all made to scale, NRA scale. So I can set them out at the various ranges, 20 yards and so. And I uh, shoot offhand, just like I'm at a real uh, at a real uh, silhouette event. So they're a great gun to have, and, and uh, you don't have to worry about uh, and you don't have to worry about running out of ammo. So just have fun. And uh, I've got a, a swing target out there. I want to. That was kind of um, 
you know, you can make plain tires out of anything. I took, I took an old political sign frame and during the season, you know, that you have a political sign and then you uh, get done using it. So I, I took the frame, the crossbar, and I uh, bent a, I bent an old spoon across it, and um, and painted it uh, orange, and so there you go. Wacko. A lot of fun. So that's it. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll show you sometime again a little bit more about how these guns shoot and how accurately they uh, shoot, how accurately they perform. We'll try different pellets out and uh, different kinds of targets and see what their, what their effect is on them. Uh, one of the things if you're, if you're shooting these guns is to, again, if you're shooting it from the offhand position, kneeling or sitting or standing, you know, place it right down the middle of the, the middle of the gun should be pretty much back that, that groove in the stock right there that's open. I can place my finger in there and just let it ride in there and hold it with a gentle, gentle pressure, very gentle pressure against your shoulder. we go again. That's a one and a half inch uh, old uh, spoon. So uh, I'm having fun. So take care. Don't forget to subscribe. Benny sends his regards. He's doing very well. And uh, hit the bell so you know when I'm producing another video. But uh, God bless.